It's the Quiet Friday, the All City All NFL Podcast, the Meat Locker, Baldy, Brian Baldinger. I'm Cuz Anthony Gargano, and it's the Quiet Baldy before uh, everybody hits to Vegas. Uh, I do know the Chiefs uh, are coming to Vegas on Sunday. How about this, Baldy? Kansas City is going to leave Sunday. They were supposed to leave in the morning. They got pushed back three hours because President Biden is uh, is going out there. So they they had the Chiefs got their flight pushed back right. because of that. They, they got they got bumped for the Commander in Chief, huh? Okay. Well, adjust the schedule. Um, that's a long they, for anybody. That's ask done. America who who they prefer to have that <laughs> airspace: the Chiefs or yes, Biden. Yeah. I think yeah. you'd have the Chiefs win in a landslide. Yeah, I think uh, take all the politics out of it. Let's just watch Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey and Andy Reid and Spags go to work. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, speaking of Spags, Steve Spagnuolo, uh, will the the great defensive coordinator, will join us later in the program today. So looking forward to talking to Spags. He, you know, full disclosure, he's a dear friend of ours. We love him. Uh, he is the best defensive coordinator in all the NFL, and it's a mystery that he does not have a head coaching job, nor not, e- not even an interview. So yeah. the head coaching carousel has stopped. Seattle goes with Ravens defensive coordinator Mike McDonald, and the commanders inexplicably after losing out on Ben Johnson, Ben Johnson returns to the to, to the Lions as OC. They decide on Dan Quinn. I don't, Baldy. I just think that's mystifying. Now, I mean, he's been a head coach. He's he's you know one of those guys that's going to get a second chance after what happened in Atlanta, and things did not end well in Atlanta. Um, the thing that was disturbing at the end in Atlanta was how broken their defense was and how the level of miscommunication and just, I mean, I could still see like these receivers running wide open down the uh, the freeways of the Atlanta secondary week in, week out. And the communication was just awful. And I remember one of the things Dan had as a head coach was tell the truth Monday. That was his big thing. Tell the truth Monday. And I just kept scratching my head watching these breakdowns going, is anybody telling the truth? So I'm not here to to throw cold water on the hiring of Dan Quinn. But this is on the resume. And then, look, they did a lot of good things at Dallas. I think over his three years there, they led the league in takeaways. That's I, I think they were number one in that department over three years. I don't have all the stats in front of me, but they were at the top of the leaderboard. That's a good thing. Um, they won a lot of regular season games, but they were not good in the postseason. And to me, when you look at a guy like Steve Spagnuolo, and he's going through this gauntlet right now of Miami, Buffalo, Baltimore, and he's going against these quarterbacks of Tua, Josh Allen, and Lamar Jackson, and he's slaying the dragon in every city. You go, I want – give me that re- give me that resume. And he did it last year with six rookies. Oh, by the way, he's just got five Super Bowls. Dan, he's in his fifth Super Bowl. Dan Quinn just got d- destroyed by the Packers. What? Yeah. It's uh at home. I, I, look, I mean, if that was their if that if that was the Washington game plan, we lose out on Ben Johnson, then this is our fallback position. So uh it's 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 a little bizarre. 
Mike Vrabel, Bill Belichick are not going to be head coaches this year. Like that's not going to happen. I would have thought five weeks ago when this whole process started that both those guys would be employed and it didn't happen. No problem with Mike McDonald going out there to Seattle. They get a, you know, a 36 year old, you know, mastermind himself who has done it at the college level and at the pro level. So, you know, you know, it's funny. He reminds me, Mike McDonald reminds me of young Pete Carroll. Yeah. Well, I mean, there was a time when, but I, you know, I think, you know, Pete was, he, he bounced around New England, the Jets, and then went to, you know, college, obviously won the national championship at USC. And, you know, he did it in both. And then when he went to Seattle, I don't think anybody thought that it was going to be, not be a good hire. One thing I always liked about Pete is he was not afraid to play freshmen. He was never played, uh, afraid to play rookies. He just felt if they were the right guys, if they were wired the right way, if they make mistakes early, we're going to win late with these guys once they get those corrected. And, and, and that was a sound philosophy from Pete. So let me ask you, let's get back to Washington for a second, because it, it is, you know, kind of mystifying as we're saying. Now, I, now I don't know that, you know, it, it felt like, you know, Ben Johnson was their man all along. There's rumors out there. I know that Mike Florio wrote about this, that Ben Johnson's asking price was pretty high. And that kind of that spooks some teams, you know, which is odd because I, I always thought, you know, I mean, Josh Harris is a, is a, is a, well, one thing he is, is a guy that will spend on coaches. I saw what he did with the Sixers. He spent money. This guy that never, you know, he never cuts corners. Well, cause I mean, Jim Harbaugh just signed for 16 million with the Chargers. They don't have anything near, near the resources that Josh Howard has. Josh Harris has. And they said, we we think the coach is worth it. And whatever he wants from his assistants, we're going to give him that. We're, we're going to give him the bag. He can spend it any way he wants. Now, that's that's just the going rate. You know, I mean, Sean Payton last year went for higher than $16 million. You want what you think is frontline coach. like. But the thing that – like, I'm not here to dispute Mike Florio and any information he has, whatever. The, the Washington Brain Trust was on a plane to Detroit. I don't think that they were there to talk to Aaron Glenn. I think they were going there to sign Ben Johnson. And Ben Johnson, while they're in the air, decides that. So to me, the money was already, to me, it had to have been established. Like they weren't, Yeah, they, they're not getting on a plane to go to Detroit to talk to Ben Johnson. And then find out, oh, the price tag is too high. Yeah. Like to me, I, I, exactly. it was already parameters of what it was going to cost. So while that might be out there and people might be talking about that and they might have gotten spooked, like I just don't feel like you're getting on a plane and then you're going to negotiate a lower price tag. Like that, that's yeah. not the way the movie works. No, I agree. I, I like, and that's why it just didn't fit to me. Now, what I think happened, I, I don't know, but my guess is. They wanted that thing wrapped up. And so, yeah. you know, there could have been a situation where they didn't want to wait until the talk to Spags. Like, that, it, it always hamstrings the team that goes to the Super Bowl, their assistance, because teams got to wait before you can sit down with them. Well, that's true, but they, they already waited a month. So what's, what's the issue with waiting another week? I, I listen. I you know I agree with you, obviously. So because I, I you know, know I'm just trying to figure it out. About, like sometimes, like the wait is worth it. You get the right guy, and you might not know you got the right guy, yeah. even though he wasn't number one on your list. But you know what does get eaten up in this whole process are good assistant coaches. The good assistants get plucked. Oh, you know yeah. whether coordinators or position coaches, he's like that. Well, speaking of which. Antonio Pierce, I, I love what he's doing. I love his staff. I like what the Raiders are doing. And I love adding Kingsbury to, to be the OC. I think that's well, a I great, Cliff, I think that's a great I, I hire. Texted I texted Cliff yesterday. And, you know, part of the problem, like they sent, once Antonio Pierce took over, I think the last nine weeks, they gave up the fewest points in the league over the last nine weeks. You know, they, they took down the Kansas City Chiefs. I mean, the Miami Dolphins scored 20 points. Like, they kept the score down um, over a nine-week stretch. They just couldn't score points. And so, I mean, if you're Devontae Adams, if, 
you know, I mean, you go through the list of guys, Josh Jacobs and Cliff Kingsbury is coming to town. Like that offense, it's going to open up. Like it's not just pure air raid. Like Cliff knows how to throw tight ends on the field and, you know, goal line offense and all that stuff. But um, I thought it was, I thought it was a great hire. I thought the Raiders, uh, they, they will be an exciting offense. And if they combine that with good defense, um, you know, they, I think, I think they're on the way. I think they're going to – we'll see what they do at quarterback. You know, Aiden O'Connell, fourth-round pick, played well at times last year. And maybe Cliff thinks he's the guy, but maybe there's another guy out there that says, this is what I want. He knows. I mean, he only worked with Johnny Menzel and only worked with just Caleb Williams and Patrick Mahomes. I mean, he's worked with some great quarterbacks in his stretch. So, um, he knows what he needs. And, and Kyler Murray was really good his first year and second year, went to the playoffs with Kyler. So he kind of knows what that position needs and how you have to play at that position. Yeah, I love what the Raiders did, man. I do. I, 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 and it's funny. There was there there were rumors that Chip Kelly was in the was in the running for the OC job for the Raiders. I'm like, oh no, Chip wants to be an OC. No, and turns out they go get Kingsbury. Great stuff. So the carousel has stopped let's get back to the super bowl niners chiefs and i i gotta ask you because one of the things that's been speaking of mystifying it what happened to the niners defense like that's something that i i'm kind of surprised at well first of all they're healthy Okay, I mean they don't have anybody that's out. I mean they're starting defensive line right now of Bosa and Chase Young, along with Eric Armstead and Javon Hargrave. Nobody has more resources put in their defensive line than San Francisco. And you can look at their backups, whether it's Randy Gregory or you know Javon Kinlaw, whoever. They're getting pushed around. And Aaron Jones went 18 for 108 with some explosive runs. We saw Montgomery go for almost 100. Jameer Gibbs had his runs. Uh, we saw Jamison Williams go for 42 on an end around. They're getting pushed around up front. And with that, it's it's really, I feel, like this is just me. If Fred Warner was on this call with us right now, he might disagree. But I feel like the linebackers are almost guessing sometimes because of how the guys up front are getting pushed around. And that's not supposed to happen. And Nick Kacarek is – is a very good defensive line coach, but, uh, you know, Steve Wilkes can't be pleased with how they have played in these last two playoff games up front, especially against the run, especially against outside runs, which has been a weakness all year against this defense. Yeah, that's something that been really surprising. And, uh, you know, because it's funny, you know, watching the first two, these first two playoff games where, you know, well, Green Bay moved the ball, Right. I mean, you you watch Detroit up and down the field and the Niners defense, like the, especially like you mentioned, the front seven. W what's going on up front? You know, I know we're, you're d dissecting the tape. What do you see up front from that defense that seemed to get more pressure? It doesn't seem like they're they're able to bother the quarterback as much. Well, I mean, you know, in order to get pressure, the quarterback has to hold the ball. But, I mean, if you go back to the Minnesota, uh, they, they got beat by Minnesota halfway through the season in that three-game losing stretch. I mean, I remember that day Kirk Cousins dropped back 45 times. He wasn't sacked one time. And I would said at the time, that's a bad plane ride home from Minnesota to, to the Bay Area when you don't get Kirk Cousins down on the ground once. So they're running the same twist stunts. They're running a lot of the same fronts. A lot of the same stunts where they get a fifth rusher, Fred Warner or somebody else, a fifth rusher do it to try to get more pressure. But they're not simply not winning one-on-ones up front right now. And that's not what how this thing is supposed to be built. And then you've got to get off blocks. they got to get off blocks in the run game, which they're not doing. And so that's that's pad level. That's, you know, using your hands. That's stacking and shedding offensive linemen. Um, Kansas City's looking at that, and Andy Reid's going, and Patrick Mahomes and Isaiah Pacheco, they're like, look, we just have to do what Green Bay and, and what, uh, you know, what we just saw from Detroit last week. Like, this is 
all things that we can do, that we do do, power runs, inside zones, doubling defensive tackles, like they got to do much better up front holding the point. Yeah, I, uh, it's, it's funny. You know, first half of this season, I mean, they were pretty, I mean, they were pretty stout, right? I mean, I know uh, in week two, the Rams scored 23. Rams turned out to have a really good offense. But if you go through it, I mean, they, they dominated the Cowboys. Remember that game? But, 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 but look, cuz, this is why they traded for Chase Young. Yeah. This is why they went after Randy Gregory. They know they needed reinforcements. Now, you can argue whether Chase Young has been worth the third-round pick that they gave up for him. Maybe they should have given up a second-round pick for Montez Sweat, who looks like a better player at this point. But they they went after reinforcements knowing that this is they need a better – they need a better, more impactful defensive front if they're going to win the Super Bowl, which was their goal all along. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, the most alarming, I guess it all started, really started with that Ravens game, week 16, where, you know, Lamar and Baltimore just shreds them. Yeah. But even, you know, even week 18, um, the 49ers started their number one defense and Carson Wentz and the Rams went right down the field and threw a touchdown pass to Puka Nakua for a touchdown in the opening drive. And they ran the ball with a backup running back and, you know, backup players across the board. And they ran and they, they scored on the opening drive. So this has been going on now for a while. And what they have been able to do, they, they led the league. And now after the postseason, they lead the league in takeaways and in interceptions. So they have taken the ball away. You remember Dre, Dre Greenlaw with the two interceptions? Yeah. Um, you know, with with uh, Tayshawn Gibson, you know, forcing a fumble, Armstead recovering it. They've been able to take the ball away to slow these teams down in the postseason. So so let, let's look at that matchup because coming up, the, the matchup, I think, will dictate the whole game, which is Shanahan versus Spags. It's amazing. But let's start with the Chiefs offense and Andy against the Niners defense. And kind of, you know, where they're vulnerable and where the Chiefs can attack. Now, obviously, they're going to want to run it with Pacheco. And they, like you said earlier, they seem pretty, pretty soft in that sense of recently. But the other aspect is Mahomes, who could buy time, which will, could really wreak havoc against that team. And Nick Bosa has come out and said, both these offensive tackles, Juwan Taylor and Donovan Smith, he's gone up against both in different places, hold a lot. Like, yeah. I think Nick yeah, basically letting the officials know, like, be on the lookout for this, yeah. uh, you know, on Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, don't be afraid to throw a flag. Um, you know, we've seen as few as five flags thrown in a championship Sunday between the Chiefs and the Ravens. I mean, five. They're not throwing flags they got to be pretty egregious for these officials to throw it just the way they officiate these playoff games. So, you know, it's something to look forward to, but yeah, look, I mean, I don't know. Like I, I know against the Eagles, San Francisco thought that Jalen hurts drops his eyes, reads the rush. So they purposely didn't try to sack him. They wanted him to hold the ball and take and drop his eyes and then, you know, just keep him in the pocket, not let him, Escape. Now, I don't think they'll do that with Mahomes necessarily, but you've got to have a game plan for when Mahomes escapes because um, he's the ultimate point guard. He can run with it, and he's excellent at it, at extending these plays. And then he also is excellent at playing point guard and drawing the defense to you and then dumping it off. So it's it's a fine line right there dealing with Mahomes. And, and look who came alive during the playoffs with Travis Kelsey. Well, I'm doing this thing I'm at the NFL Network right now, and I'm doing this thing on Mahomes to Kelsey in the playoffs. And, you know, Kelsey has 23 catches in the playoffs so far. And almost half of them literally are what they call stash rash. Like, it's just these stick routes to the tight end where it could be just turn around and catch it or just bounce off the line of scrimmage. Well, that's, like, that touchdown last week against Baltimore where he tucks it right in the corner of the end zone – was sl sliding catch that was just an incredible throw by Mahomes. Well, that 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 that's different what I'm talking about. I mean, that right. was just how they they operate. Yes, it was only where Kelsey could catch it. It's his third touchdown in the postseason. 
right now. But, you know, they had so many throws in against Miami and Buffalo and then last week where Mahomes is just literally doing nothing more than turning a double play. The ball is just out of it. As soon as he catches the shotgun snap, he's just throwing it to Kelsey. Could be behind the line of scrimmage. It could be just a turnaround. It could just be a stop where if they're in zone coverage and they're just dropping, the ball's in his hands, and then he goes for four yards. And all of a sudden, you get six yards on first down, and you're on schedule. Wait, can I just go back to one thing you said, which yeah. was a great analogy. Nothing but turn it a double play. Yeah. Like, that's, that, that's such a great analogy. Was that yours? Of course I it's just, yours. No, it's mine. It's mine. But, I mean, that's, that's what it looks analogy like. analogy because it shows you how quick he gets, he gets rid of the ball. I mean, if you if you, I mean, if you just go back, Derek Jeter turning a ju- double play, like it, the ball's in his glove that long, you know. Um, That's if his awesome. dad having a pickoff at, if, you know, if his dad's on the mound, Mahomes' dad is on the mound back in the day with the Texas Rangers. Like it's a pickoff play at first base. The ball's out of his hand so fast. Like there's no defense for that. That's a great. That is just such a great analogy. What a great analogy, man. I, lo- I just love that because it's so true. And, and you know, we always talk about arm angles and everything else. All right, let's get to, and this is completely fascinating, all right, because to me the whole game, and you and I were talking about this before the show because we're two geeks, but the, the, the game's going to get played. It's Shanahan and that amazing offense – and all the intricacies against Spags, who once again will be joining us coming up. So these, this great offense of mine and this great defense of mine are going to clash. And that's going to be probably the answer to the game. You know what's interesting, though? Like yesterday, Jed York spoke, the owner of the yeah. 49ers. And he – this was amazing because uh, we, we need to put this into our – our podcast here, but he came out and said that Kyle said in training camp last year, Brock Purdy's rookie season, he tells the owner, listen, I think Brock is our best quarterback. This is Kyle saying this. Now there's Garoppolo there. There's Trey Lance. There's all, they've got all these resources in these two quarterbacks and Shanahan's telling Jed, look, I think Brock's our best, our best player. He goes, now I'm going to do everything I can to get Trey up because, you know, I'm going to work with him and I think we could do something. But he knew he had a premonition that Brock Purdy was already number one his rookie year before he ever saw the field. And so then, you know, Jed says, well, they, you know, they, they, they played this game against, you know, he's a mock up, mop up duty guy against Kansas City, ironic enough. And he has one pass and it's, it's in the, he throws it away into the stands. And Jed's like, well, he threw the ball in the stands. Is that what you're talking about? He goes, like, you know, Kyle's been around these guys his whole life. And, you know, you get these instincts about you. Like Andy had these instincts about Mahomes at Texas Tech going back to his freshman year. And you almost like it's, – it's almost like – um, uh, it's almost a, a show all by itself. When I first saw – like when I first saw Allen Iverson, you know, on a crossover dribble, you know, in high school in Virginia or something. When I first saw, like, I remember Cliff Kingsbury tell me the first time he saw Mahomes do anything was a, was a bat was a Texas playoff basketball game, you know, in Tyler, Texas. And he's sitting in the stands and Mahomes is draining threes in the game. Like it's almost, it's, it's, that's the show. Like, and it's for Kyle. I remember when, I first saw him. You know, it could have been his dad when he first saw Elway. Or, you know, it could be anybody. But I, I, to me, I love, I love that stuff. I mean, you know, th- and this is, it captures the essence of why we all watch, why we do this. And we love it because we love, you know, greatness. And, and we love this. We love these games. And when you're looking at incredible achievement like Mahomes to go back and there's something that'll catch your eye. It's, it's a... It's a great idea. Yeah. Well, anyways, so it starts with Brock Purdy. And one of the reasons why I think the 49ers are here 
because the defense has not been shut down, um, is because I, I believe that Brock Purdy is just the silent assassin. He doesn't look like he should be an assassin. He he doesn't he, – when he came out of Iowa State, he was drafted in the seventh round for a reason. He has his title about him, yet he plays the game with no fear. And if you're going to play not just for Kyle Shanahan, but for Andy Reid, you think about Andy coaching – McNabb or Alex Smith, great players in their own right, won a lot of games, won playoff games, went far. Did they have that that fear factor where they didn't fear throwing an interception? Like, did they live with that fear of, I'm not making this throw because what if this happens? Like, I feel like Mahomes plays the game without any fear. Now, he's not turned the ball over. He's playing. He's seeing the field very well right now. But he has. He's gone through stretches. His even his mom is like, well, you know, it'd be good if they caught the ball. Like, he never complained about any of that. I'm sure he was. But to Brock Purdy, like, yes, he's thrown interceptions. And, yes, there's some that probably could have been intercepted in this stretch. But he doesn't live in fear of that. Like, he comes back and he makes these layered throws over the middle of the field where those are the throws that you have to make if you're going to win a championship. That's what I want at my quarterback. Like, he might come up short on Sunday, maybe. But at the same time, he's going to give you a chance to win on Sunday. And I just feel like there's something special about a guy that doesn't feel that pressure, that doesn't play into that fear factor. And I think that's the biggest thing. Yes, his arm, he can get anywhere he wants to. We've seen him extend plays. Um, he throws the ball with, uh, with a cute touch, but he also plays it with no fear. So now we've also seen him – turn the ball over and mm -hmm. this will be interesting because while Spags treats him with and you uh, again we're going to be talking to him coming up about pressures and he's got an array of pressures and he'll try to confuse you all day long and this is where the chess match comes into play because John Harbaugh said it last week or said it the, the other day about last week that you got to run the ball against the Chiefs. You just have to. And that's, they're going to have to try to run McCaffrey, have to do that, establish that, and then work off of it. Because if you're put, if you're going to go third and seven, third and eight, and, and hope Purdy bails you out, that's going to be tough. Well, one thing I know about Kyle, he's not abandoning the run. Not with Christian McCaffrey. Yeah. Like, he got 17 carries against Green Bay. He got 20 last week. Um, he's, he, you know, he had the 39-yard touchdown run against Green Bay. Like, you have to feed the beast. Like, he's not going to abandon that. Now, if you're three and out, three and out, three and out, it'll look like it. But he's not going very far away from Christian McCaffrey. Now, when you do get to the blitz game, I feel like I, I, I'd be surprised if McCaffrey even comes off the field. Like, there's no rotation. There's no need to bring him off the field. The guy is the most conditioned athlete on the field. He's living for this moment. Yeah, he, he, he is. He's, he's, he's an he's amazing player. player. He really is. And you know, one thing that jumped out last week, because, like, I, I should do a breakdown. His pass protection was outrageous. Yeah. There's three or four times where he had to pick up the blitz. Now, last week, Justice Hill, the running back for the Ravens, was awful against the blitz. Yep. Like, he got beat three times. And Lamar was running for his life. Like McCaffrey is much better than Justice Hill. Because that, that's a good philosophy. Like if you blitz and it forces McCaffrey to stay in and pick up the blitz, you take him out of the passing game. And then if you could get the matchup, whether it's Justin Reed or Drew Tranquil, that you feel like you could beat McCaffrey with a bigger guy, stronger guy, um, that kind of thing. Like that's a good back-on-backer approach. Um Within the game plan of things, you can see that. But, yes, I th and I feel like they'll be much better prepared for the blitzes than what I saw from Baltimore last week. They know they're coming. Yeah. To Spags' credit, he disguises them. He rarely sends just one. It's usually multiple players. He usually sends two. Where if your protection picks up one, we still have the chance of another one coming free. And he likes to do it with secondary players. He, because of their speed. 
the speed of Legereus Sneed or McDuffie or you know or Reed or Edwards, it's just they're just if they get if they get free, they have a faster chance of affecting the quarterback. It's a philosophy of Steve's. Like I'll take my guy off the corner, and all I got to do is speed up the process of Purdy and make him hurry th- things up. And maybe in rushing him, we can get an errant throw, a mistake, a throwaway. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean that's going to be the aim. Now we're looking at the Niners, I, and uh, look, Shanahan's terrific. He also has great pieces to work with too, because you got to love Kittle, and then you got Ayuk. Debo, Jennings, like that's a that's so much deeper than what Baltimore or Buffalo or even Miami because Miami no Waddle, like that's a that's a there that's the deepest offense that they're going to see, like the most explosive offense I, that he'll see. Yeah, I think I think it's a good point, Cuz I really do. And what we have seen from both Kittle and Debo, and not, not to take anything away from Ayuk. Right. But but Debo and Kittle play the game with the ball in their hands. Like they refuse to be tackled. Yep. I've talked to I've talked to George about it. Yeah. And it was it was not how he played the game coming out of Iowa, fifth round pick out of Iowa. It was brought to him by uh his tight end coach going, you need to build a mentality that you're not getting tackled by one guy. You're not going down. When you watch George break tackles, and Debo's the same way. Yes. You know, Debo from the waist down looks like a top flight running back. But, you know, just how strong he is. But both of those guys run through tackles. And, and look, McCaffrey does too. Yep. So tackling, and, you know, to Spag's credit, his, his group tackles really well. But tackling is going to be an issue because they've got three guys in San Francisco whose mentality is one guy's not bringing me down. And they I get a love, lot I love of that Debo, man. I Debo Samuel is just such a what a player. Oh my God. I love that dude. He's he he is such team, a player. He gives that team a toughness. Yeah. That is just different than any other player on the team. Like his and and his ability just to extend plays after contact, all that stuff is just uh it, it's special. It's a special quality. Mm, yeah, it's. I mean, it's. I mean that that matchup is going to be awesome. Like that's the one thing about this Super Bowl that I probably I'm looking forward to the most is is the Chiefs defense against that Niners offense and Shanahan Spags. I, I I'm just like to me it's captivating. Like what we'll, like on maybe on Tuesday we'll do like a, a like a deep deep dive after the game and Tuesday after the game just kind of breaking down like piece by piece, like each move on the chessboard. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Steve can, you know, it's, you know, he's got two weeks to get ready and I'm sure he, he thinks it's, it could be a blessing or a curse in getting ready and it's going backwards. So if you think about last year, cause like the, 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 the chief scored on two touchdowns to Kadarius, Tony and to sky Moore on motions that bothered the Eagles against the Jacksonville Jaguars in week four. And they saw something with the way the um, the, the Eagles covered uh, this ghost motion and what they, how they, and they used it against them from a game against Jacksonville in week four. And they actually scored two touchdowns against it. And they pulled it out, dusted it off. They might have double checked with Doug Peterson and used that connection just to make sure they they knew what they were seeing, because Jacksonville used a motion to score against the Eagles in the rainstorm at the link. Yeah, and then they dusted that off and rehearsed that, and it really was a, a big part of how they scored those two red zone touchdowns against the Eagles last year in that second half. Yeah, man, that was incredible. I mean, that was that was completely that was amazing. Uh, hey, Baldy, what would you do with an extra hundred? If somebody gave you a Franklin, what would you do with it? Well, if I was in Vegas, I'd just go put it on black. Yeah, see, you would, and yeah. then you would turn that hundred into God only knows. But listen, yeah. 
if you're looking to go to Vegas and you're looking for tickets to the game, I got your answer. The Game Time app. All right. And in fact, use the code Vegas 100, V E G A S 100. You get 100 bucks. That's right. Off the ticket. So you can hang out and do the whole thing and do like Baldy, put the 100 on black. Go 13. That's my number. 13. <laughs> the, uh, the game time app is tremendous. All right. They're going to take all the stress and the guesswork out of tickets, right? Like, so. We're fans, and we love this stuff. So whether it's basketball, hockey, baseball's around the corner, theater, comedy shows, or the summer concerts, right? The Game Time app has got you covered, man. Uh, you can see where you're at, the vantage point from your seats, right there on the app, man. It's, it's pretty cool. You can save on zone deals. You can save on last-minute deals. So, you know, if you say, I want this section, they'll say, all right, well, we'll get you the row in the seats and you'll save 18% off that. They're obsessed with saving you money. Also, they give you job protection, uh, job loss protection, event cancellation protection. They're it. They got everything covered. And if you somehow find tickets cheaper, they'll refund you the difference 110%. All right. If you're not going to Vegas, then use the code all NFL, A L L N F L. That gets you 20 bucks off your tickets if you're going to basketball or concerts or whatever. Use all NFL. All right. Go to the Game Time app. The code is all NFL. You get 20 bucks off. The Game Time app is it's a must when it comes to buying tickets. All right, Baldy. So coming up, the man in the hour. We're we're uh very excited to talk to. Spags. Were you in Baltimore, Bali, or I was were in, you I, here? I, I, I was in Baltimore last Sunday, Steve. Okay. Yeah. But you, weren't there. you here? Weren't you here for the Miami game too? I missed you one of those games. I I, I wasn't up for the Miami game. Um, okay. Not because you know it's too cold or anything, Steve. I was just yeah. in another, I was, was at another game. It was legitimately cold, guys. I can tell you that right now. That was. I, I heard. I heard Andy lost all feeling in his fingers. He, yeah, he didn't have any gloves on, so the next day he was. <laughs> He was fighting a little bit, and it was legit cold. Legit oh yeah, cold. I, don't, I don't know if Anthony could have been out there for that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe little Ant could have played in it. <laughs> yeah. How is the little guy doing with the football? He's doing great. So he's going yeah. to go to Saint Augustine and nice. uh, playing linebacker, and um, awesome. yeah, and then the little one is is taking the quarterback, right? So I got him with. Yeah. There's a kid, there's a guy, Frank Delano, he, he does the Manning camp. So he's oh nice. He's, he's coaching Massimo. So I got I got my linebacker for Andy Coach Bags guy. and a quarterback yeah. for Coach Andy. We'll talk, we'll talk that quarterback into playing defense somewhere along the way. Yeah. <laughs> he should be playing safety anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, how about in Spags We Trust? Oh, oh God. I was the greatest. Let's not go there. Let's not go there. I'm burning all those shirts. I told those guys who, I'm burning. Who, whose idea was that, Steve? I saw them all wearing them, you know, on pregame yeah. warm-up last night. I, I think, Baldy, I think it was Justin Reed. He's he's beautiful. Okay. I think he's the one yeah. had him. Uh, he's responsible. He's the guy I got to get after for that. He's in trouble. But you know, you, you know what's awesome is how much they love you, right? Like, you, you, well, that piece of it, those players that you connect with, I, I mean, I, I think it's beautiful, man. It, it's it, it's something. It's a byproduct of this sport and yeah. of what you do and who you are. And and to get kids, you know, to, that have that kind of adoration for you, I just think it's beautiful. It's a, it, listen. It's a special group. Um, it, it's been one of my most enjoyable years. I mean, we all say that when we win, right? But. I, I, I would, would have been saying that had we not played the playoffs. This group, to a man, it's probably, I've said this before, Aunt Baldy, um, it's probably the highest number of high-end cerebral players that I've had in a group to work with. Like, I've had some really smart, you know, Tyler yeah. Nath, Anthony Hitches, a lot of, you know, Antonio Pierce back in New York. Mm -hmm. But as far as a collective group of them, this is probably the most. D lineman, linebacker at all levels. And they love playing. They love being around each other. Listen, the love is mutual. These guys, 
Um, they're, they're like they're like Marie and I's kids, and, and we yeah. we approach it that way and love being around them. I kept praying. You know, we went to the first playoff game, and I prayed for another week to work with them, and then then I prayed for another week, and now fortunately I get two more, which is which is a good thing. Steve, so you talk Marie, about real quick, real, real quick. I follow up. Is Maria cooking her oh, special, yeah. her special oh, yeah. meatballs and the, and the parm and everything else? We we've got everything. So Friday, the Friday practice, it's usually banana pudding for everybody. Um, that and then whatever else she's making. So it's been a plethora of things, right, Kelson? And then on Saturday morning, we give out what we call a cram awards. You know, the big hit. You know, we call it cram award. Uh, and they they get a plate of pasta. So they, they, everybody, they don't want game balls anymore. They want the plate of pasta. That's what they want. <laughs> That's so they've, been, they've been fighting over that for 20 weeks. <laughs> it, 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 it was an unusual rookie class last year that you got to work with. And now we see him in the second year, whether it's Trent or Jalen or Joshua, you know, or Karlaftis. I mean, it was an unbelievable rookie class yeah. that you, Got, I mean, the, and you got them on the field. And I know Trent probably is better outside than inside, but he played inside because that's where you needed him. And yeah. To your to the, the the football IQ that you're talking about, the the ability to kind of mix and match and play these different spots in your defense. Like I just don't see young that many young guys around the league on the field all together playing like veterans, Steve. Yeah. Baldy, you, you, you're seeing exactly the way it is and what uh, Anthony and I were touching on. I mean, you're not able to do multiple things or be versatile unless you've got guys that can think that way. Yeah. And listen, uh, Trent's the, probably the best example of it being inside, outside, but LJ has done the same thing, LJ yeah. Snead. Justin Reed goes from dime back to safety. Mike Edwards does the same thing and moves around. Drew Tranquil. Drew Tranquil could play anywhere. He could be playing yeah. safety. I'm not so sure he couldn't go out there and play corner. But, you, you I mean, it's one thing to have the skill set to change. The, it's another thing to have this part, you know, in the system to know what you're doing. And these guys, to a man, do that. And, it, it listen, it makes it enjoyable for if you're a coach and you're able to coach those guys. The other thing that I don't want to get lost there, and I wish more people would talk about, Anthony and, and Baldy, is, yeah. the assistant, is the assistant coaches. Yes. Because you can't do this on your own and feed it to all the guys and get it detailed like it needs to be, and for those guys to rally with it, you need. And I've got we've got a staff here that's terrific, and I think Talk those about guys. Them, deserve, Steve. Yeah, l- listen, I, I've been we've been fortunate, and that for the most part, it stayed as the same group for the five years we've been here. Now, uh, Matt House, we lost, who went to LSU, but and Joe Cullen came in, but you know Dave Merritt and. Um, you know, D- Donald, the, the secondary coaches have been with us. Um, Joe Cullen now has a D-line. Terry Braden is his assistant. Alex Whittingham and Rod Wilson. Rod played in the league. Those yeah. guys were behind the scenes. And uh, we just got Brendan Daly moved from D-line to our linebackers. Ken Flagel is with us. He was there in Philly. Oh, with Kenny, guys with that's your guy. Linebacker. Yeah, Flage, yeah. he's great. So these guys, it's, a, it's, it's just a wealth of knowledge. They work. They're fundamental coaches first. They're tremendous teachers second. And we work collaboratively, and I just I love the way we do it. We've been doing it that way for the five years here, and I think that you're seeing the, the fruit of it now. And uh, So it's really a player's coach's thing, and it really has worked out pretty good. Steve, for 21 weeks in a row, you have a seven-day life cycle that you're getting ready for a game. You get two weeks for these Super Bowls. Does it is it a blessing or a curse? that you get two weeks to get ready for these games. <laughs> You've been through it enough, Baldy. You know it's a little bit of both, isn't it? It's yeah. a little bit of yeah. both. Um, I was just on with Westwood uh, the radio station there, somebody that we did a podcast with, and they kind of went down the same road. Here, here's the fight, and Anthony, you'll understand. Here's the fight you have as a coach when you have this much time. You, you want to keep adding. You want to keep adding. You want to change. You want to tinker. And yet you can fall into a trap that way. And then all of a sudden you got guys out there not knowing what they're doing. So, you know, it's one of these balancing acts. Um, you know, we're, we're putting in, we're really hitting it hard this week, you know, a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday setup, because we know next week we'll be kind of polishing it with all the distractions going on. And then we'll home back in on, on Saturday and Sunday and play the game. But what happens to the coaches is you get all this time. And if you've watched, X number of games, you're throwing another game on, right? Yeah. Game that you haven't yeah. seen. 
Yeah. And then you see something and you're like, well, we could do this against that. And that's what you got to fight and be careful with because once it's in, at some point you just got to let it roll uh, and let your guys play. So it'll be a little bit of a balancing act. And yet, if there's something that we find in there uh, that we think we need, we'll, we'll get it in next week. How, how was – let's go through the run itself because it starts – on that extremely cold night against Miami and you got Tyree kill. It, it, it almost reminds me of when you were with the giants and you had that, you know, crazy you know, run through Tampa and Dallas and green Bay and then New England that gauntlet. So you're at, at Miami and you got Tyreek and it's cold. And what take us inside to your kind of what your approach was against the dolphins. Well, I think we benefited a little bit having them up here. Um, you know, the elements, the, it was real. Like, the, the cold did have an effect. I wasn't really sure going into the game whether it would or wouldn't. Um, but our guys, I mean, it didn't seem to affect our guys. They stepped up. They were ready. Uh, we felt like in a cold day like that, if you could be the more physical team, you know, it would work to your advantage. And, listen, Tyreek is elite now. Um, every time he got the ball, it was a little scary. But... You know, LJ and Trent and the guys that we put on him did a great job in that game. And, you know, we got we got out ahead a little bit, you know, forced them to throw the ball a little bit, kind of played in our hands. And so that was a that was a real gratifying win. You know, the one thing, too, guys, in being in these playoffs, it, when you get in the playoffs, getting that first playoff win is really important. I mean, to get on any kind of roll, you got to get the first one, obviously. But sometimes that can be a little bit taxing. And, you know, our guys kind of stepped up and played well there. It's funny when you talk about the Giants one, Anthony, we were in warm weather in Tampa. You know, Dallas was indoors, and then we go to Green Bay, had the other extreme yeah. that year. It was, but it was cold. It was cold in Buffalo when we played that second game. Although it felt like a little bit of a heat wave coming from the – because yeah. the Miami game was like 30 below. Buffalo was like in the 20s. So, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it felt like a heat wave. And then it got a little warmer for the Baltimore game. So it progressively got warmer each game. <laughs> How, how, what kind of challenge did, did Josh Allen present then to you? Yeah. Oh, well, listen, I'm not sure we, you know, I think he still played a really good football game. And we made, we made a couple of key plays. Um, our offense moved the ball a little bit. But they, we played, what we did really well in that game was we played good in the red zone. Um, I, I believe, if I'm, if I'm not getting the games mixed yep. up. But they moved it a little bit, but we were able to force them to a couple of field goals and get a stop, you know, and then we rallied at the end there. But he, I think he's one of the, I mean, obviously, he's one of the elite guys. That goes without saying. But he, he's so big. You know, it's one thing to be a quarterback that can throw and uh, be able to run. But when you run like a fullback, how many how many quarterbacks do that? I mean, at the goal line, you know, it's two, three-yard yeah. line. It's a automatic yeah, touchdown. The first time we played him here at home, he just bowled over a bunch of guys down in the goal line. So, But for, luckily for us, you know, we got enough points. And, they, you know, listen, the – the good Lord blessed us in that one. They missed that field goal. Um, although I would have been okay going back out and trying to stop in the overtime yeah. game, just because we felt at that point we were doing pretty good. But that that was that was quite a challenge at Buffalo. You know that you know what that place is like. Yeah, Bills great Mafia. Fans. Everything's crazy. Yeah, great fans. Yeah, great football. Yeah, Steve. Was- Steve, is there a point in these games, including last week against Baltimore, where you you feel like we got them. The game plan is working. Or is it just nerve-wracking to the very end? I mean, Legarius obviously makes a play in the goal line on Zay Flowers. It's yeah. an amazing play. I mean, it's 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 literally bang bang, right, Steve? Like that like, yeah. is across the goal line done. I mean, got it out. But is yeah. from your standpoint, Steve, calling these defenses, do you ever feel like we got them? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure I ever have. Um, I'll be honest. I mean, you got to be up by three possessions and be under two minutes or something, maybe feel that way. This, I don't ever, I ever, never get in the relaxation mode. As a matter of fact, I talk to our guys all the time that our job never changes. It doesn't matter what the scoreboard says. When we go out there, we're trying to prevent points from getting on the board, right? Keep them out of the end zone. Don't even let, let them kick a field goal. And that has never changed in my mind. And I really, quite honestly, no matter what the score is, I feel that way because when it's all said and done, we want to be able to look up there and say, "Hey, we limited them to this, that, and you know, did enough to make help our football team win." But I think it's nerve wracking all the way to the end. I mean, look, you go to the ball, go go to last week, they drive it a little bit and they kick the field goal. They do the right thing, right? Because right, now right. it's a one possession game, one score game. And so once they kick that field goal, 
all I'm thinking about is the next series we've got to go out. That's all I'm on. I'm, I'm talking to them about the, here's what's going to happen. Here's what we need to be ready for. Uh, and if they had, you know, if they had stopped us on that third down, they got, we're going to be punting and it's going to be two minute drill. I mean, a lot of these games in the playoffs, you guys know, come down to two minute drills and we've got to be ready for that. This whole run, you know what's so interesting too is you think of <laughs> Buffalo and, and there's Sean McDermott and then there's John Harbaugh last week. Like, yeah. you guys, it's amazing. I mean, the success that, you know, with Andy and you and the whole tree, which is like a forest now. It's awesome. We were all birthed right there in Philadelphia at the home <laughs> in the homeland. No, they, we, listen, we, I go, you know, when you, when you play those guys, you usually go back in your brain and your Rolodex. I can remember many nights sitting with John, you know, it's getting to be 10, 30, 11 o'clock. You're wrapping up and you sit down and you talk for 15 minutes, you know, and it's, and it's not just about football. It's about everything before, you know, John had his first daughter, you know, there was talk about that. And, and so that go in Sean and Sean and I worked close. Sean, I think took every job. I, you know, I, I moved up, he took that one and, and he was great. It was great to watch him grow and mature. He came in there. I think he worked in the um, marketing department and then ended yeah, up being yeah. Andy's assistant. Oh, yeah. He, yeah, came over to coach. And so love, love seeing those guys succeed. Love competing against them. And we all love competing against each other. It is sad. I'd be quite honest with you. There is a part of me in both games that when the game's over that, you know, you know what that feeling's like on the other side. And then so yeah. I felt for both, for both of those guys. Steve, um, <laughs> Obviously, you've got a reputation of being this mastermind of blitzing and pressuring and all that. But you have like a number of different types of blitz zeros, and you might do it in the red zone. It might be first and 10 deep in their own territory. Like, is there a method to when you dial that up? Well, I would say this ball going in, I probably have a, you know, I'll probably lay things out of situations that I want to use it. And then I quite honest, if I'm being real honest, it probably ends up being a feel thing um, or personnel that maybe they put in. Um, you know, if, if we get something that says, OK, when these guys are in here, it tends to be this, you know, you try to. Well, I'm, I'm, I will say I'm always we're always looking for spots where we can do that, where we, we think it would be best. Um, and you do got to be a little bit careful too, because the last thing you really want to do in any of these games is give up the explosive plays. I'll be honest with you. So the what you know the pass on LJ before that fumble. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I blame myself for that. So I got a little tricky. That's what happens. I got I got a little bit too cute. I was trying to confuse the quarterback, and so we ran something that we normally run, but it puts a little bit of strain uh, on the corners. He's the deep guy there, and it, and they ran something that's really challenging to the to cover in that particular um, coverage and it got LJ. I apologize to LJ for that, but I'll tell you what, this is, this is, this is us in a nutshell. That's an explosive pass play, but LJ found some way to get him on the ground so we could line up and play defense again. And three or four plays later, he causes the fumble. So that's a credit to him. That game, I remember going into that game, yeah. you were, you were like, Hey, look, one thing we have to do is, we got to stop the run, man. We got to yeah. be able to really shut down that run. And I mean, you could see the effort that, that, that the guys did. And I mean, that was a, a tremendous game plan. I mean, I know that was in your back. Well, your mind. they, I, we had to do that. And in the two plays, if you guys go, go, guys go back and look, they're, they're calling for me here, guys. So I may have to. Oh, okay. Soon. Yeah. But the, um, the first play of the first half and the first play of the second half, when they tried to run, and I thought our guys knocked it out set a tone and it really was the credit to the players that executed what we were trying to do against the run they did a great job all right listen you go go to work we, we love yeah. you all right you guys are the best good luck. even though thanks, i can't Scott. see you baldy it's good seeing you <laughs> thanks steve appreciate all you buddy right, guys. See you, love you guys all right here he was Spikes! baldy just to just to kind of wrap things up for where we started how is that man not a head coach? I'm sorry. I mean, I, I, that makes no sense to me. Well, for a lot of reasons, it doesn't make Like, he might be the best big game mastermind in the game today. Like, out of all of the defensive masterminds out there, he might be the best. He did it last year, cuz, with six rookies that all were on the field at some point or another. He's 
started four in a Super Bowl, and now those kids are in their second year, and they're wearing T-shirts saying, in Spags, we trust. Like, can you get a bigger advertisement for his prowess and how he goes about his his thing? And and then just, I mean, we didn't ask him for, you know, specific game plan stuff. I mean, that's that's his, you know, that's his bag. But you could just see the approach. Like, why wouldn't you want his approach to, okay, Josh Allen is a fullback playing quarterback. Like, we have to – or let's stuff Lamar on the first play of the first quarter and the third quarter, and maybe they'll get away from what they do best. Like, just the little snippets right there. You could see, like, what he's telling us is what he's standing in front of the room with his whole group going, if we can do this, guys – Dude, I mean, you're so right. I mean, think about this for one second. I, I, I know, you know, we're belaboring it today, but it needs to be belabored. So if you're one of these owners and you go, well, what do I want? I want someone that's a big game coach, that's X and O savvy, that can lead men, right? Like that's, you know, in a nutshell, what you want from your head coach, right? Yeah. So... You already said he's a big game coach. This is Super Bowl number five for him. All right. You you, you know he's an X and O guy. We see it every week. And then you, to illustrate how much he can lead men, there's his secondary wearing t shirts, like you just stated. It's yeah. bags we trust. Does that not yeah. illustrate that players will go to war for you? That. And then if you just go, just you you asked about the gauntlet, cuz. They went, Miami came to town. They went to Buffalo. They went to Baltimore. All three of those quarterbacks, Tua, Josh Allen, all right, Lamar Jackson, are in top five in some level or another. And he made them all pedestrian, all of them, in this just in this run. Then the other part is, okay, he has – gone up against every day in practice, Eli Manning, Donovan McNabb, and this giant in Kansas City right now, Patrick Mahomes. Like he knows what the other side's supposed to look like by just going up against him every day. When w- Whether it's the leadership, practice habits, leadership within the team, face of the organization, he knows the guy that you need on the other side to help, you know, to balance everything up. Like, wh- like he could be your GM, your defense coordinator, your head coach, and and stand up in front of the room and get everybody's attention. I don't know. I don't get it. Um, Dan Quinn. All right, Washington. Good luck. Uh, whatever. Uh, listen, great stuff today, as always, my brother. And uh, I'll see you in Vegas on Monday. All right, man. <clears throat> Let's, what uh, what, what we, are you guys doing, man? You know, you know. Huh? I'm following you around like a puppy dog, so. Yeah, you know, Jaws is having a cigar party on Thursday night, you know, and trying to get into the U2 concert at the Sphere on Friday. And, you know, we'll, we'll uh, you know, there's 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 events to go to, cuz, right. that we need to show up at. All right, I'm, I'm with you, brother. I'm with you. Uh, for Baldy, I'm Cuz. Please hit the subscribe button. It's right there. It's free. You get us every day in your inbox, so. We love you guys. Thanks. Have a great weekend. And we'll see you from Vegas on Monday. We all city like the mayor.